in the next chapter of your life, you'll be able to persevere through any mid-career struggle you're facing while navigating the uncharted waters of your next chapter. How do I know? Because you're listening to this podcast. Get ready to shed your current identity and shift into the next chapter of your life that's narrated by the future of you. What's up, everybody? Today on the show, I have Adam Leipzig. So in each of these episodes, I search really hard to find guests that I think can help you navigate your next chapter. And a buddy of mine, Matt, said, I have a friend who is a movie producer who's currently filming in Sicily that I think would be amazing for your show if we can get him. And it turns out that he just wrapped production on his movie in Sicily, so the stars aligned. So let me tell you first about Adam. He has been involved in producing some incredible films like The Dead Poets Society, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, March of the Penguins. He's also a professor at California Berkeley Haas School of Business and is the CEO of Entertainment Media partners. So I wanted to have him on the show because in doing my research, I came across a TED talk that he did about going back to his alma mater, Yale. And he noticed how this group of people that were around him were some of the most privileged people in the world. And many of them were not so happy. And his TED Talk, which has now been viewed by over 15 million people, explains why all that privilege, all that prestige, all that money are not always the things that make you happy. So I also asked him in this interview about how he thinks about creativity and the power of making something that you like Because as you're stepping into your next chapter, you may be at ground zero and you may have no idea where to begin from a creative standpoint and trying to figure out what sort of content do you make? What kind of business do you start? And I asked him a ton of questions around that and his answers were incredible. So I'm borrowing his movie production knowledge and applying it towards your next chapter. So We dug into the idea that many people come up with things for their next chapter that start at their head and stop at their neck. But for anything really to have legs, to have meaning, it's got to be in your body and it has to be emotional. I mean, when I think about my last chapter, it was all in my head, right? I want to be a chiropractor because I want to make money and I think I could be good at it because I can use my hands. But it was not something that was deeply emotional that was like from my neck down, right? It was a very logical decision. So as you're navigating your next chapter, I want you to think about about all these different things. Okay, you're going to love this interview. Please enjoy this conversation with Adam Leipzig. Adam, welcome to the show. Thank you, Robert. It is so good to be here. <laughs> I am super excited to get into all of this today. Let me give a little bit of a preframe. This podcast is about helping people who are in all stages of development of, let's call it their, their next chapter. And I can't think of a better person to talk about that with than you. So thank you for taking the time to do this. It is my great pleasure. We all have a lot of chapters in our lives, don't we? We have we have a lot of chapters. And we have a mutual friend in Matt Merrick. And uh, don't bother Googling him, everybody, because he's a ghost. <laughs> you're, you're not, you're not going to find much about him. And I was talking to him about this new podcast I'm doing. And, you know, I said, is there anybody, and I didn't even get the words out and your name popped up. So you were kind enough to be willing to, uh, to jump on board with this. So I'm super excited. And I think a good place for us to start would be with your TED Talk. And the title of the TED Talk is How to Know Your Life's Purpose in Five Minutes. And this talk was fascinating to me and now for well over 15 million other me's in the world. And it was fascinating to me because you discuss how at your alma mater, Yale University, how you are being surrounded by some of the most educated, 
and privileged people on the planet. And you started to notice that they weren't they weren't so happy. You would figure that would be the secret, right? You know, you get the education, you've got the money, and you know, you reference the first wife, the second wife, <laughs> you know, you got you got everything going. So could you talk about why you decided to do that talk? You know, college reunions, reunions of any kind are a really great sociological experiment time slice because we have a cohort of people who are largely the same. They've had, at least in college, the same four years of formative experience. And now we come and look at ourselves 10 years later, 20 years later, 25 years later. And it's so interesting to see who was happy and who was not. And what I discovered is that the people who went to college to go get a job because their mom or their dad or their social circle said, you're going to be a lawyer, you're going to be a doctor, you're going to go to Wall Street. They were all at their half-life moment at the around the age of 50 uh, saying, I feel like I just wasted the past 25 years. It wasn't meaningful. And then the rest of us who had studied English and literature and theater and history and ancient Greek or things that have no obvious practical relevance in our transactional society, we were all pretty happy because we had discovered how to live, how to think, how to have relationships, and how to do things that we really cared about. That was a big revelation, and it was a pleasure to be able to then figure out how to put that into a concise TED Talk that could be shared with a lot of people and could give people some pathways and some guideposts for how to evaluate why we do what we do. And the idea is if we can figure that out early enough in our lives, then it helps us be happier for a longer period. Why do you think, I mean, I, for me, and this, I'm just going to take a stab at this and you can tell me what your thoughts are here, but it would seem to me that many who come from backgrounds, you know, like Ivy League, Ivy League kids, et cetera, it would seem to me that they, one of the things that is really important for them is to be able to make a bunch of cash. You know, perhaps their their parents were wealthy, you know, their surroundings triggered them to work for Goldman Sachs and become a hedge fund person, et cetera. But in the end, if they follow that, many of them, even though they have the trappings that come with it, the house, the cars, the trips, the blah, 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 aren't that happening? The ones who were you know, studying things that were more soulful seem to be happier. So is it that they are perhaps misguided from the beginning in what it takes to be happy or like what's your thoughts on because you're right there seems to be two roads i think it's about finding yourself and doing what you feel you need to do for yourself rather than social or family expectations of you and i think that the people who just did what was most true to their core principle of being have stayed the happiness. Don't get me wrong. I'm not opposed to people having cash. I I want all of my friends to be highly, highly compensated. Um, I actually think that if we were really highly compensated, we would do more good in the world than perhaps a lot of people who have a lot of cash. Uh, so I, I think um, money is not a bad thing. Money is a good thing as long as you earn it ethically and uh, in good relationship. But look, what do we take with us when we're, when we're gone? We don't take our stuff. We don't take our cars. We certainly don't take our money. We take our relationships and we take the pathways we have left behind for others to follow that might be patterns of value to them that they can emulate if we have done good work and led a, uh, led a valid life. I think that's what I think that is that's part of what contentment and happiness is. 
All right, we're going to circle around. I have a few more questions later on in the interview around money because it's a big one that pops up. And I, mm. and the reason why I'm I'm pushing it is so many people are making decisions based off of that and really have a difficult time choosing what lights their fire. Mm. And sometimes in midlife, they they say, you know, screw it. It's not, it's not worth it anymore. It's not, the, the money isn't even worth it. I need to be happy. I'm halfway done with my life. Yeah. But I want to, I want to dig into a few things that, you know, in the intro, I talked about who you are and what you do and and the things that you've you've done in the past. So we don't have to dig too deep into that. But there's a few things that I want to talk about in terms of really how you think about things. You've had the privilege of supervising movies like the Dead Poet Society and uh, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids to producing movies like The Way Back and March of the Penguins. So I want to spend a few minutes on those penguins. So you, to to my mind, think outside the box, and we'll just use that term, right? In an effort to help people who are trying to perhaps reinvent themselves right now, step into their next chapter, do what's next for them, how do you think about thinking through a new idea of what you want to do? Do you have a process for how you do it? Or how do you think about something new, like ideation? That's a big one. (laughs) Yeah. I think about what I respond to. And I have a very, I have a very low boredom threshold. In other words, if I've seen something before, and I start to see something similar to it again, I get bored very quickly. I don't like to be bored. I don't think most people like to be bored, Um, but I have a very low tolerance for boredom. So as I'm thinking about a project, a film, a company, an idea, if it feels familiar, I move away from it really quickly because I'm just not into the familiar, the formulas, the things that we expect. I also have this this, uh, principle of dramaturgy, which is the audience- again, sorry. Principle of dramaturgy about the way uh, way stories and narratives are constructed. Uh, Dramaturgy. uh, Which it's a theater theater term. um, Okay. uh, That uh, the audience should never be ahead of the story. Right. If the if the audience is ahead of the story, if the audience sees the twist coming, well, then you've lost them for the ten minutes before until the twist is revealed. So you you always actually have to when you're telling a story, when you're creating um, a film or an experience, you actually always have to stay ahead of the audience by at least a few paces, so they can have that experience of discovery, uh, revelation, surprise, and invention themselves. So I always, I always, so first it's my very low boredom threshold. And then there's also an element of collaboration in it because goodness knows I am not the smartest, most creative person in the world. And other people are, I care a lot about working with very good people. So it's about finding good collaborators to work with. And then as a producer, because my Metier is really being a producer. It's not a writer. It's not a director. It's not other things. It's being a producer. As a producer, creating an ecosystem in which creative people can do their best work with the right level of resources and uh, resources of, of time or money or other creative people or physical space so the good work can be done. I think that's where that's where new ideas and that's where uh, where products that are out of the box come from. Okay, let's stay on this for a second. I was listening to, I'm a big Jerry Seinfeld fan. He just, mm. I, he just cracks me up. I think he's hysterical. And he's got a new, uh, a new audio book out now that's basically a coffee table book. That he calls the audio book a coffee table book for his comedians and cars getting coffee book. Okay, only Jerry can do that. And it is, in there is an interview that he did with Mel Brooks. Mm. And he was talking about the producers, ironically, Mm -hmm. right? Very meta in this conversation, but he's talking about the producers. And Jerry had asked him a question. I don't remember the exact question, but it really doesn't matter. His answer is what really struck me. He said, I create things that I like because if I like it and I laugh, 
they tend to laugh too. So I was wondering what your thoughts are on creating something for someone else versus creating something that you just like. Well, let's figure out who the someone else is. If you're creating something for your for your spouse, your life partner, someone you know really intimately well, like you're making the perfect day, afternoon, evening vacation, you can probably do that because you you have you have lived and eat and drunk and slept with that person and you know that person. But the other, the larger thing of uh, let's create something that I don't know, Netflix is going to buy that yeah, right. uh, is going to be a big hit the, that the critics are going to love. You cannot ever know that. You don't know that. And this, and I think Mel Brooks's advice is really good. Make something that you love and that you respond to. Uh, uh, p- w- when people come to me and try to pitch me a project and, and say, this is uh this, this is a certain hit for pick an actor, pick a streaming platform, pick a studio, like, no, you're trying to make something for them. And let's talk about how those entities actually create content. What you see now on screen or on streaming is something that they put into development between one and five years ago. Their brains are already far advanced of that. So if you try to replicate what you're seeing right now, I can virtually guarantee you that they're not interested in it because they did that already and they too have a low boredom threshold. <laughs> Uh, so the idea of doing something that you respond to yourself uh, is the key. I actually have a very, I'm a very emotional person. I cry at movies all the time. And uh, I cry when I see dailies, if the scene is great. I, I, I have found that if it's something that moves me, it's probably going to move other people. Have you watched White Lotus? I have watched part of White Lotus. I'm not all the way, all the way through and no spoilers, please. I want to go back to those penguins because I'm fascinated by those little guys. The film became the highest grossing documentary of all time. Did I get that right? It's the highest grossing nature documentary of all time by an exponential amount. And it's the second highest grossing documentary of all time. The highest grossing doc is Michael Moore's Fahrenheit 9-11. March of the Penguins is and remains the second highest grossing doc of all time. Okay. When you were sitting down to create that with your your team, did you have a specific set of expectations that you had? In other words, you know, we're going to pay X for this. We wanted to do X. Was there any of that sort of thing at the beginning? Well, this is a film that I did. I was not there at the initial inception of, and it's a film that I got involved in after it was initially created, it's a fabulous story. Uh, I was running National Geographic films at the time. And when you're running a company like National Geographic, you hear about all the people who are photographing animals around the world. You hear about three completely committed Frenchmen who have wintered over in Antarctica with 16 millimeter cameras shooting footage of penguins. So it's like, okay, got to go get involved in that. And I called the agent. At that point, the film, they have just been, they'd been, and they were doing it on film, 16 millimeter film. There was uh, every few weeks, they were putting the film in an air cargo plane from Antarctica to a lab in Paris to get developed. Uh, so I called the, the person who was representing the filmmakers and I said, we would love to get involved. Uh, we know it's not even cut together yet, but we think that, you know, there's, there's got to be a movie in here somewhere. And uh, she said, wow, you know, I would have sold it to you a few weeks ago, but uh, we did a rough cut and Sundance just let us in. So we're, we're going to, you got to go to Sundance and go compete with the rest of the world to see this movie. So I said, okay, we're going to do that. And at that time, National Geographic didn't have a distribution arm. Uh, the distributors are the people who actually get the movie from the hard drives to the cinema near you and let you know that it is there. So. Over the next several months, this that was in September, Sundance is in January. So over the next few months, I negotiated deals with several different distributors, uh, including all the ones that you can imagine, and uh, we made we made deals that were that were were great for 
both of us. And I said, we're going to go to Sundance. We're going to go buy this movie. We need a partner. Here are the terms. Uh, got several distributors to agree. Uh, and there we were at Sundance in the Eccles Auditorium, 1,200 seats, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, second day of the festival. The filmmaker, Luke Jacquet, uh, who had first thought about doing this a dozen years ago and was then a 35-year-old man, stepped down off the stage, having introduced the movie. The red curtains open. There's a little trailer to uh, thank the Sundance volunteers. Everyone applauds for the Sundance volunteers. The movie starts. And... The first thing we hear is Euro EDM techno music. And then there's a hole in the ice, if you remember the, the film. And one penguin pops out of the hole. The second penguin pops out of the hole. The first penguin turns to the second penguin and says, Bonjour, chérie, ça va? And the other one says, Oui, tu vas bien? Et toi? And they continue speaking in French like that. The entire film is French speaking penguins. Well, not exactly speaking because their beaks don't move. Uh, they're telepathic. And we learned Holy that the shit. premise of the movie is that penguins are French and they telepathically communicate in French. And this did not go over too well with a Sundance audience. Four of the five distributors that I had pre-negotiated with ran for the exits. Uh, but one of them, brave Mark Gill at Warner Independent, stayed. And looked at me and said, what do you think? I said, look, what you saw is brilliant. And what we heard isn't. And everything can change. The clay is still wet. Uh, this movie is plastic. It is not finished yet. And in the next 90 days, we hired a beautiful composer to write a gorgeous orchestral score, a composer named Alex Warman. We hired a beautiful writer named Jordan, Jordan Roberts to write poetic words, hired Morgan Freeman to speak the words. and then at the end of June, put the movie out as March of the Penguins. Now, you may say, to go back to the beginning of your question, did I have any expectation for what it was going to be? I paid a million dollars for that movie. Uh, and there was actually an article in Variety, I'm paraphrasing, but it was something like, stupid idiot pays a million dollars for a movie about penguins. So, so, but, I, so I, but I had modeled, um, we had modeled some returns and we thought we could probably break even. It wasn't guaranteed, but maybe in like 50% of the scenarios, we lost money and the other 50%, we broke even. And we were starting the company, National Geographic Films, and it felt like a good thing to put our stake in the ground and say, here we are. Uh, so we did some financial modeling. and But the important thing conceptually is that I didn't think of this film, we did not think of this film as a documentary. And we didn't think about it as a nature documentary. We conceived of the version of the film that we created, uh, that which is the version that won the Academy Award, as a love story and as a family movie. And it's really important when you're thinking about projects to position them in the right way. For example, a more recent documentary that I made called A Plastic Ocean, uh, we never called it a documentary. We called it an adventure film. Uh, just because we didn't want to be in the box of all the other documentaries. And A Plastic Ocean also did really well. Didn't do the same kind of numbers at the box office, but that film has had an extraordinary life, has changed, uh, has had an effect on a billion people around the world, has changed more than 150 laws around the world uh, in terms of plastic recycling and plastic production. But it's because we, we created an emotional story and we didn't call it a documentary. So we could actually meet people where they are and what they would like to go see. So let me circle back on this for just a second. The one decision that you made to buy this film at Sundance for a million bucks and add a musical score and the voice of God, Morgan F Freeman, obviously it was a, a huge turning point for National Geographic. But how did you find the courage or conviction to step into that level of faith in something that was completely unknown and clearly a little on the hokey side? I have a lot of belief in my instincts. And I have stared professional death in the face multiple times, and it doesn't scare me. Why not? Well, I just pick myself up and go on again. 
I've been doing this for a few decades and I've had great days and bad days. And I have had movies and projects that have hit and movies that we thought were going to hit that did nothing. And you can't even find anywhere on a streaming service because they've completely disappeared from, uh, from our cultural lives. I think the key is persistence. And I just keep going. So I do believe in my instincts. And my instincts are wrong some percentage of the time. I won't know until I get further down the road. My instincts are better today than they were 10 years ago and better still than they were 20 years ago. And they keep getting better. There's an area of our instincts where we always have blind spots, where we always, you know, because we we have to convince ourselves that we are right to do what we do. Because I mean, you know, we're as a producer, what do we do? Really? We blow on the embers after everybody has walked away from the fire. And we keep blowing and blowing and blowing. There are projects that have taken me 10 years to get made because I kept blowing on the embers. And if I hadn't blown on the embers, they wouldn't have been made. So I'm just used to continually getting up, dusting myself off, and going forward. I want to talk a little bit about your teaching. Okay. You are on the faculty at UC Berkeley mm -hmm. School of Business. Yeah. And you teach in the MBA program. Mm -hmm. What techniques or approaches have worked best to help your students find what their passion is? You know, you've got this history now where, you know, you're you're sort of on the the other side of things, you know, you've, you've done the Ted talk, you've, you've been to the circus, you went to the, you, you went to school, you got, you, you went best, one of the best schools, if not the best school in, uh, in the world, you are doing things that are just truly making a difference. And so you've got this wealth of information and knowledge, and you got these young, these young kids that are absorbing every word that you're saying, and you know, inside what is truly going to make them happy. Is there any approaches that have worked for you to help your students find out what their passion is? What I, you know, what I teach, Robert, is uh, is communications and communication skills, and I teach it both at the MBA level and also in at the executive level. I also teach in the executive education program, where we teach people, senior leaders at Fortune 50 companies, uh, how to do, how to be the most effective at what they do. And communication is so much a part of what you do as a leader. I stress authenticity, which comes back to what we talked about at the very beginning of this discussion about uh, who you really are and following who, your core. Because as a leader, if you're communicating something that you don't believe in, that is not authentic to you, you know, we're going to smell it. We'll, we'll even smell it through the Zoom screen. We can tell. And, and we can always tell it after, as we start working together in our classes, Within a half a day, the class is able to identify if some participant is speaking something that isn't true, that they're making up, that is inauthentic, that they don't believe in. And then I just ask these questions like, okay, you've been asked to do the following thing by your management team, and you don't think it's good, and you think it's going to hurt people. How do you feel about that? Should you be doing that? And I don't actually judge it because sometimes you sometimes you do need to do things you don't want to do. That's part of that's part of our life, but it's very good to ask that question and to make sure that you're staying authentically true to your own core principles and beliefs. We we don't really we don't really go into what is your life purpose. We go into very practical things. Uh and, you know in the same way and you know maybe we'll talk about this uh the company that I run now called Media U where we're very practically focused on how do you train and mentor the next million media makers in how to have creative careers, uh, creative careers across the 150 different professions of the media industry, uh, which are not just writer, producer, actor, director, cinematographer. There's another 144 of them. And how do you find what's really right for you? And then how do you go get a job or a series of gigs and actually make a creative career out of that instead of having to drive Uber or work at Starbucks to feed you know, something else. Yeah, no, actually, I want to get into that through talking about storytelling, because mm. 
I think, you know, whatever someone's next chapter in their life winds up being, knowing how to tell a good story is somehow going to be a part of their life. What are your best tips to tell a good story that perhaps maybe you haven't shared before? Sure. I agree with you. I think it is it is about the story because story, and just for like 30 seconds on why, mm-hmm. because stories are patterns that we can emulate. And a and your story is yours to tell. Also, your story is yours to choose. The story that you tell about yourself isn't just retroactively, retrospectively, how I got here. It's about who you're going to be going forward. And that is a that is a pathway that you're you're actually um, you're you're actually using your machete to carve the path forward as you tell that story about where you're going to go. So, what are some of the tips that I would give? Many people tell stories with their head and stop at the neck, uh, but you have to tell your story from the neck down. It's got to be emotional. It's got to be in your body. You've got to hit the emotional. Um, you've got to hit the emotional components uh, when you're telling a story. It needs to be relatable. You need to be relatable. You may be talking with a person or an audience where you have really divergent histories or age difference or cultural differences. Uh, You need to start at some place which is common to both of you or to you and your audience, which is really relatable, something that is uh, a universal experience or universal feeling that then lets you move forward. The stories do not have to be long. They should only be as long as they need to be. Sometimes a single sentence can be a story. And when you're telling a story, this is one of the, I mean, there's this really interesting thing about neuroscience that neuroscience tells us that if you're telling a story really well and the audience is, is wrapped and listening to you, the neural pathways and sections of their brain will light up in exactly the same way that the storyteller's brain is lighting up. There's this incredible neural empathic thing that happens when you're listening to a good story because the story takes you out of the Zoom you're in, the seat you're sitting in, and it just moves you into some other space. So uh, neuroscience is very interesting about that. How do you actually get there? Because when you're telling a story, you can't possibly verbally describe all the things that are going on. The imagination takes over, and the imagination is our storytelling best friend. When we tell a story, we just have to give a couple of very concrete details that are visual or otherwise appeal to the senses. And then in the audience's brain, all the other details are going to fill in. Maybe if I was successful talking about um, seeing March of the Penguins at Sundance, in the Eccles Auditorium at 1,200 seats, and Luke coming off the stage, and the curtains opening, and the little trailer for the for the uh, for the volunteers. Maybe if I was successful at that, you saw that. Maybe you you were in that room for a minute. Now, I didn't talk about the other 1,200 people in the theater, what everybody was wearing, what the air smelled like, if it was warm or cold outside. Uh, there's all these details that I didn't leave did, did not include because you don't have to. Imagination is your friend. Just a few small, concrete, sensate details. Sensate meaning that appeal to the senses, auditory, visual, um, taste, smell. Then it lets the audience fill everything else in. And your story feels robust, even if it's only 30 seconds long. Those are amazing. You, uh, you had me at hello. You know, there are emotional things that we just respond to. You know, my daughter uh, was singing today at, uh, at one of the churches for school. They, mm. they went and they did a Christmas, a Christmas thing at the church across the street. And all the parents were there and little kids come down the aisle and they're, they're, the kids are singing on stage, but the little, little, little ones were carrying candles. And as people looked over, they saw these 20 or 30 little kids walking to the stage to join them in candles. In unison, everybody was in tears. Like it was a visceral response where everybody was just moved that way. I recently had the privilege of going to La Scala and having a private meeting with an opera singer. We had some champagne and he sang sang for us. And it was- Wow. 
the moment he opened his mouth, it, it, it was uncontrollable. Te- I mean, it was like maybe no lie, four or five seconds after he started singing, we all just started to cry. And it was this strange, like what you're talking about with neurology, this strange visceral reaction that we all had. And I suppose that what you're trying to do, I don't want to put words in your mouth here, but I suppose that what you're trying to do with Media U is be able to help people to understand how to do things like that. Is that right? Yeah, how to do things like that and how to uh, how to collaborate with others in doing things like that. Uh, because, you know, when we're making uh, a show of any kind, a good production manager will help it happen and a terrible production ha- manager will destroy it. Mm-hmm. So it's not just about those... Um, those high those those areas of media profession that are uh, that receive the most attention on page six. It's about the uh, entire collaborative set of many many teams. I mean, we you know if if we ever stay through the credits at the end of a movie, which I I I confess that I do for ten minutes while everybody else has left the theater, mm-hmm. five thousand people have worked on a movie. And every why, one of why do you stay? I like reading the names and I like seeing all the categories. And every once in a while, uh, after the six minutes, there's a name that pops up of someone I know. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay, got it. Let's talk a little bit about Media U. Um, yeah. I'm not entirely sure that I understand what it is that you do there. I know I, we're we're doing this uh, recording on Zoom, and I can see behind me you're in a beautiful loft in sunny Los Angeles. So I know that much, but I don't know anything else. Media U is completely online. Mm-hmm. It is designed to provide accelerated training and mentoring in the media professions. Uh, we are just coming out of our eggshell. We have four programs up now, and we're we're building more for 2023. Uh, it is designed to give people pathways and to open the doors of access and to reveal what really goes on inside multiple media professions. Because as I mentioned, there's 150 different professions in the media universe. The, the media industry is really interesting because sometimes we uh, we work for a company where they give us a 401k. And sometimes we, most of the time, we work in a gig economy where we have to create our own 401k, where we are entrepreneurs for ourselves. And we have to find out how to do that. What are the what are the personal technologies for us as we emerge into that this field, or even as we're as mid career? How do we upskill and train ourselves? Our programs are short; they are months instead of years. They are inexpensive. They go from free to a certificate for about thirty five hundred dollars. So it's super inexpensive. Uh, we're building relationships with university systems, uh, which in some cases will uh, ingest our content and offer it uh, for continuing education credit. We actually have that relationship with the University of California right now. And there are a couple of other university and college systems that we are in discussions with. And we just want to open up the doors of access. We want to make it clear how it's done because, you know, when, when we hire people to come into our companies or to work on our shows, we don't want to know, well, we, I've never asked where somebody went to college ever. I've said like, what's can I see your reel? Can I see your portfolio? Can I know what you've done? Can I see your CV? Uh, I have to talk to your references and see if you're a good team player. Do you know how to collaborate? Do you understand the ground rules? Um, and that's what we're doing. We're building out these programs so they can be highly accessible, so we can um, diversify and democratize this industry. We're here to train the next million media makers and the next million after that to be able to have productive, creative careers. When we talk about a media maker, just to make sure, I know that you mentioned that there are, you know, well over a hundred different categories within the within that genre. But, you know, for somebody that, you know, doesn't fancy themselves as a, a grip or a writer or something like that, but perhaps is making content online mm-hmm. or yeah. is doing podcasts like I am, things like that. What is available for them within the university? There, there, there are certain things that are available now, and then there's a lot that's going to come. 
Uh, and the focus is on how the real situation really works. Uh, for example, uh, you got a you got a great podcast set up. I'm looking at your mic. Uh, yep. you you know you're all set up, um, and uh, maybe I love that mic. It's the Shure SM7B because I know everybody's going to ask me. Okay, um, I don't know what mine is, but it sounds pretty good, right? It it sounds great. Yeah, but. I had to go figure that out for myself. There was no easy, fast way that I could just figure out what's the best way to get this set up, hooked up right, have the right kind of connection, uh, the right kind of recording, et cetera. Wouldn't it be great if you could just do that fast and not have to yep. go search and, and autodidact yourself on every little thing? Also, maybe you want to then think more broadly, how do we get more people to listen to this podcast? Yep. That's a whole other part of the business. To, and to be able to do that and to actually have a roadmap where it's, this is what you do. Here is how you do it. That doesn't exist. And it's incredibly useful for people. In our remaining moments here, I'm going to ask you some questions. And you may be like, why is he asking me these questions? These are really weird questions. Just roll cool. with it. Is this a lightning round? It's kind of a lightning round. All well, right. it's, a, it's a little bit a little bit more. I, I, I added a few that you don't know about. So Great. I'm ready. What is your superpower and what is your kryptonite? Persistence is my superpower. Persistence mm -hmm. is also my kryptonite because I will sometimes keep going on something that I should not have kept going on. Got it. Just busting through the door. What do people often get wrong about you? That I'm an extrovert. Ah, you're situationally extroverted. Yes, but I'm an extreme introvert. Gotcha. Okay. What are some things that you're currently doing that you really don't love and you'd like to do less of? Well, I just had a meeting with my company's accountants yesterday, and I have to go through all the spreadsheets and I have to do it, but I really, really don't like doing it. <laughs> By the way, it's the number one answer I get to that question. Yeah. What is the one rule that you have for yourself that you'll never break? Don't get into business with bad people. Hmm. What new behavior or habit has most improved your life? Eating well. What's an unusual or absurd thing that you love? So somebody would be like, God, that's so weird. He likes that? That's unusual. I will sometimes watch the movie trailer channel for two hours. I didn't even know there was a movie trailer channel. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> that is definitely unusual and absurd. So you're literally listening to In a World over and over and over. Yes. But after two year, two hours, I feel like I've watched 40 movies. <laughs> That's really incredible. If you could spend one month anywhere in the world, where would it be and why? It would be anywhere my wife is because we love each other. Oh, that's a really sweet answer. Are there any positions or opinions in the last few years? Uh, it could be way back. Uh, it doesn't have to be in the last few years that you've changed your mind substantially about where you've shifted your position. You, you know, I used to think this way, but as I'm getting older, I think the opposite now. Yeah, I used to be more judgmental of people and now I really meet people where they are. Mm, that takes a while to get to. That's good. What is the most important thing that people should know about you? I believe in them. Do you collect anything or have you ever collected anything? No. And no. What do people never ask you? but you wish they did. They asked me about the penguins. They asked me about, you know, dead poet society, but they never asked me about this. The completely surprising literature that I read. Such as? I read literature in ancient Greek, medieval French, medieval Italian, Latin, contemporary French, Italian. And that's what I look at now. Do you speak those languages? I speak French and Italian. I read the others, and I love reading old, what was called classics. I don't really like that term, but um, I love reading. I love reading Plato in Greek. I love reading 
the French medieval romances in, uh, in their original French. I love reading Dante in Italian. I live two blocks away from Dante's house. Um, please, I could... please, please wait for the house for me. <laughs> <laughs> what book have you reread the most? Thucydides, The Peloponnesian War. Hmm. Two more questions. What is your guilty pleasure? Chocolate ice cream. <laughs> that was good. But although yeah. occasionally it goes to mint chocolate chip. You know, you, you're making me laugh because I, when you said chocolate ice cream, for some reason or another, I got a, a picture of mint chocolate chip. And I just recently listened to a story and it was about, you know, the designer Isaac Mizrahi? Sure. All right. So he's doing a show on Broadway and he's terrified to do this show. So he calls his friend, Liza Minnelli. And he says, Liza, I'm terrified to get up there. You know, I don't know what they're going to think of me. And she says, what's your favorite ice cream? And he says, my favorite ice cream. She says, yeah, what's your favorite ice cream? He said, mint chocolate chip. Why? She said, I want you to go out and get some mint chocolate chip and put it in the in the freezer. Either way, no matter what happens, <laughs> when you come home, <laughs> that mint chocolate is going to be there waiting for you. You got and a I, good I don't, You got a good outcome. <laughs> I don't know why, but that really stuck with me. I love. That. Okay, last question. We'll change it up a little bit. What one question would you like to ask me? Has your move to Italy? achieved what you wanted it to achieve 10x 10x because i didn't know what i didn't know i mm. had an intuition about it would be, what it would be like to hear the church bells and walk on the cobblestone streets and send my daughter to the hills of tuscany for her third grade school in a beautiful you know historic home, I had a vision for what that would be like. But what I did not account for was how everything would be different, where I would be talking about olive oil and wine incessantly, how I would wake up in the morning and say, what's for dinner, how my conversations with my friends would not include business. In fact, I don't even know what half of my friends do for a living. We are talking about life. We're talking about food. I did not understand or know the rhythm of the day that's here, the the coffee culture in the morning, and then the two hour lunch where everything shuts down. And, you know, th then the passeggiata in the evening where everybody's walking in the streets and the gelato in the summer. And like there is like I can go on and on and on, but I have never felt the level of soulful connection about being a human being in life than mm. I felt here and watching my old life in quotes in America is so bizarre to me now. It's been like almost two years that we're here. It's just weird. Like yeah. I'm starting to see things in the U S and going, Oh my God, that is so strange. For example, I just heard a statistic that there are almost 700 mass shootings in the United States this year. The year mm -hmm. hasn't ended. It's almost 700. You know how many there are in Italy? Zero. So there are things that you get out of and look back on and go, holy shit. Like, I, I can't, you know, does it have problems? Yeah, everything's broken here. Nothing works. <laughs> you, know I mean? you know what I mean? But Amazon takes care of a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are lots of ways to mitigate the inconveniences of living in a 600 year old building like I'm in right now. But all in all, long answer, yes. Fabulous. Thank you for that. I want to come. I want to come and experience that life. You are you are more than welcome to. Well, listen, I appreciate everything that you've shared today. This was extremely, extremely insightful and helpful for me. And like we said about Mel Brooks, if I like it, they're going to like it. Do you have any final words, suggestions, or an ask for people that are listening? 
Uh, I would ask everyone to, to be kind to each other and have a beautiful 2023 and check out MediaU, M-E-D-I-A-U.com. And it's just you, not, not university, just, just you. Just you. Okay. Adam, thank you so much for doing this today. Thank you so much. It was great to do this with you. Interrupt your pattern. It's not working for you or your business anymore. Your day-to-day -day life is consuming your potential. And if you're really honest, you're hungry for a group of entrepreneurial couples that will help you stimulate growth and innovation in your business. Entrepreneurs come up with brilliant new ideas by exposing themselves to new and different experiences. So come with us. Your next experience awaits. Check out the link in the description to learn more.